Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the IFE Southern Branches July 2021 webinar on Firestop. Right, well, I'm Andrea White, and I'm the Vice President of the Southern Branch, and I'll be hosting tonight's webinar. This is our fourth online webinar, which we've done on the first Wednesday of every month. The webinar is being recorded and we have um, now launched a branch website where we're going to post all of the webinar recordings and I'll put the link to that in the chat box uh, soon. So this has been a particularly popular webinar. We've got um, a substantial number of people joining. So can I ask everybody to um, turn off their video cameras and also put themselves on mute because I can hear some feedback. So um, that would be really helpful, please. Great, thank you. So tonight's webinar, I am uh, delighted to welcome Martin Buckroyd, who is going to give us some insight into fire stopping. Uh, before I introduce Martin, I will just say that the, um, the presentations are planned to last approximately an hour, and then uh, we'll have half an hour for q and A. If you've got a question, during uh, Martin's presentation, please put it in the chat box at any point and I will monitor those and then we can collate them uh, while Martin's speaking and I will put questions to Martin during the Q&A. So without further ado, can I introduce to you Martin Buckroyd, who is a government and fire stop specialist working with Hilti. Uh, Martin, thank you for joining us this afternoon and over to you. OK, good afternoon. Thank you for the invite, Andrea. I'll just get this presentation ready. OK. Come on, there we go. Andrea, does that look OK from your end? That looks fine, Martin. Thank you. OK, lovely. I just wanted to, I can't see this your other side of things. I just wanted to make sure it was uh, coming through OK. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for attending. Uh, my name is Martin Buckroyd. I'm a, a fire stop specialist at Hilti. I also deal with the government side of things. And uh, we'll crack off with the agenda. So we're going to have a, a quick look about the importance of passive fire protection. Then we'll move on to find out what exactly is compartmentation. Uh, a little look at the dangers of smoke. Then what happens in the first five minutes of a fire? Uh, some of you may be aware, but there are two different testing criteria uh, currently at, you, at work in uh, GB. Uh, there's the British standard and the European standard. Even though we've left uh, left Europe, apparently we still use the European standard also. Um, then we'll look at some of the popular myths and misconceptions that's out there. Then we'll have a look at how to fire stop correctly and then any questions at the end. So without further ado, hopefully you'll be able to hear and see this video. It's a very short video. Typically, five minutes is all you get. Fire, and especially smoke, spread through a building much faster than most people think. Every year, about 3.8 million fires occur worldwide, while them Damage to assets is in the billions. The yearly death toll amounts to 45,000 persons. Much of this could have been prevented if correctly installed fire protection had been in place. Architects, planners, engineers, and building owners are responsible for effective fire protection. Oftentimes, they do not realize that fire stop is not an option. It's a clear legal requirement, and negligence or improper execution is a violation of the law. 
Nearly 60% of fire deaths are not in the room of the fire's origin, and three quarters of all fire deaths are caused by smoke. When there are through penetrations in walls and floors, toxic smoke easily spreads to adjacent rooms. The keys to effective fire protection are both active protection, such as detectors and sprinklers, but also passive protection. Passive means that penetrations in walls and floors have been sealed with approved Firestop products. This principle is called compartmentation. When installed correctly, fire and smoke won't be able to spread from one compartment to another. This allows for safe evacuation of people and protects valuable assets. The thing about compartmentation and fire protection is it's only as good as the products you use. You know, one always thinks that accidents only happen to other people. That's a false conclusion. It is the responsibility of architects, planners, engineers, and building owners to protect lives and assets by effective and well-designed compartmentation. Kilty offers innovative and legally compliant, internationally approved solutions. We recommend Hilti to be on the safe side. Okay, so I hope you can all hear, all hear me now. Um, my, one of my American colleagues uh, giving a bit of a breakdown about the um, legal aspects of why we have to do uh, fire stopping and the pen seal the penetrations correctly. Um, but where do we find out about these regulations? Um, obviously, in America, the legislation is slightly different to over here in uh, Great Britain. Um, but the main part of it is the approved document B, which is part of the building regulations, which states the following areas. So they're looking at every every joint or imperfection of fit, uh, and things have to be shown by test evidence to say that it works in conjunction with the rest of the uh, frame physical framework so that's going to work fully correctly in there. OK, next slide. Yeah, um, you mentioned also about the damage to buildings, etc. Um, this is a, a slide that was put together uh, just to show again fire stoppings in place to a protect lives. It's all about life safety first and foremost. Secondary um, is to um, asset damage limitation etc and again the little details there just show you um, how much business interruption can cost in a claim uh, and obviously the biggest concern there is following a fire or an explosion okay so what is compartmentation very simply it all works uh, in conjunction with the the fire strategy we have the containment part of things we have the detection and the suppression. All, the, all those three things working together make up your fire strategy. So we have a typical building that's been, which is a, a large box and basically all we're trying to do is break that down into smaller airtight, firetight boxes. Um, Andrea, can you keep an eye on the chat? I'm just going to throw out there. Does anybody out there um, can give me a detail of what a standard fire rating of a wall would be? Sixty minutes. Yeah, so maybe sixty or thirty minutes or something. Yeah, it's pretty standard. We find that the well, the wall configurations are usually. Um, designed to 30 minutes and 60 minutes those are the pretty standard uh, wall designs so any sort of penetration that you're going through there is going to have to be reinstated to achieve that 30 or 60 minutes backing okay so that's walls what about fire floors what sort of rating do they have to have 60 minutes yep yeah, 60 minutes anyone any other guesses Anything up to 120 minutes. Depends on the height of the building. Yeah, exactly. Um, typical, typical range again for for the fire floors is uh, anywhere between EI 60 and EI 120. So again, there's a bit of a difference when you're looking at the walls and the floors. Okay. 
Okay, so we've got our lovely airtight boxes. What happens next? We come along and start smashing holes through to start running services through. That obviously creates an area of fire weakness in the walls and the floors. Um, but again, to ensure that we can get the, that time back up again, the fire stop system should have the same rating as the wall or the floor it had prior to those services being run through. So again, you can see all kinds of examples being given here. You can see cable penetrations going through, you can see metal pipes, plastic pipes, cables again, linear joint seals, um, seals around doors, etc. All kinds of different things that we've got to take into consideration and all have their own um, needs and uh, requirements that have to be done to ensure that we actually get that fire rating. OK, an example of what can happen when you don't have the right um, fire protection in place. This is the Torres Windsor Hotel in Madrid in 2005, and that's a before and after photo. So we're talking about fire ratings um, of floors. Uh, this particular um, tragedy happened. The building was empty, by the way, uh, just in case any of you are wondering, no one lost their lives. Um, in this event, um, but the the flames were jumping floors every two minutes, not every two hours, every two minutes. So as you can imagine, that went up very, very quickly. But on the flip side of things, we had an event at ICI Wilton, where, as you can see, the third story, um, Right hand side of the picture was damaged. That compartment was completely taken out with the fire, but all's not lost. You can see in both photos that there's um, lights. People are actually in that building and still working because the compartmentation worked. So when you're looking at the left hand picture, you can see that the fire door's done its work. The fire door that's open on the right hand side. It's charred, it's thoroughly done its work. Whilst you look at the physical one, the other side of the uh, door leaf, which is cl which is closed, and that looks like a, a standard fire door. Um, you know, there's no s signs of singeing or burning on that side. So the fire doors worked. And um, just behind the door that's open is a notice board, and you can see that there's pieces of paper and things attached to that. They're not singed, they're not damaged. The, f the compartmentation's worked. OK. All right. The dangers of smoke, again, something that people forget about, they think about the fire only. Um, smoke's the biggest killer uh, in fire related deaths and causes far more injuries than the flames themselves. Smoke travels heck of a lot quicker and gathers a lot quicker um, than people think. OK, so what makes smoke so dangerous? It contains all kinds of nasty chemicals in there that are bad for people to breathe in. And again, they interact with the human body in ways that we don't want them to. Uh, they can cause us pain uh, and burning sensations, etc. And um, physically scar us. Again, the one that catches up my eye constantly when I look at this slide is the one at the bottom, hydrogen cyanide. You know, obviously, breathing that type of chemical in isn't exactly very good for your health. So the effects of the smoke on the body and the mind, it causes irritation to the eyes, nose and throat through the heat of the actual smoke itself and the combination of the gases that's included in the smoke. It can cause coughing, shortness of breath, headaches. You have a, a hot, it become very hoarse very quickly. You end up with a very sore throat. It can temporarily or permanently damage your eyes. Um, the big factor of this uh, for me is the decreasing um, alertness and the confusion it can create. All of a sudden you've been used to breathing in relatively pure oxygen and your body processes that. When it starts to breathe in other chemicals, it doesn't like it. Um, and it doesn't, the effects on your mind is significant. And again, we end up with chest pains because the body's having to work twice, three times as hard to try and absorb the amount of oxygen that's in the air, but instead it's being 
you're trying to breathe in these gases that shouldn't be there, but your body's crying out for the oxygen that's very uh, scant in that department. This is one of the um, testimonies that I picked up from from the Grenfell uh, survivors. Uh, a gentleman first noticed the smoke seeping into his apartment through his door. So uh, as we all would do, he opened up the door to investigate and immediately was engulfed in hot black smoke. Immediately, he slammed the door shut. Uh, he started to panic. His whole body was trembling. His brain was completely confused. What the hell is going on? Um, and eventually he calmed himself down and started to thrash out an escape plan. He realised it was only a short distance across the landing to the stairs. It was a very familiar route to him. He'd walked it many, many times before uh, and he was confident he could do it with his eyes closed. His confidence level was through the roof. I've lived here a long time. I know exactly the route. I don't have to worry about this. I can do this. So he grabbed down a, a, a bath towel, damped it down with water, wrapped it round his head to cover his mouth and nose because he could feel the smoke. He felt the humidity of it and thought, I need to keep my nose and mouth clear. Stepped out into the hallway, again into scorching pitch blackness and tried to recreate this short journey to the stairwell, which he'd walked a thousand times before. But a few steps in, his head was already swimming. His body was already starting to become um confused um his eyes were burning his, and streaming his nose and throat felt blocked and scorched and then unfortunately he stumbled the towel slipped from his head he dropped to his knees he tried to feel around for the towel eventually found it re reattached it to the over his face but he was gagging and choking all the way through and he felt his chest was constricted finally he found and reapplied the towel. He tried to stand on his legs, which, which felt like they'd gone to jelly. And then he found he was completely disorientated in the pitch blackness. Fortunately, at that point, a door opened to the side of him and the fireman actually found him and pulled him into, into the stairwell Then proceeded to carry him down all the flights of stairs to the bottom and put him straight into an ambulance. So what happens in the first five minutes of a fire? I'm sure pretty much everybody on the call is fully aware, but just to point out and just to run it through again, we have a little video that's time elapsed that shows the first five minutes. It will jump, it will skip. We're not going to be sat here for five minutes. So this is a candle and that's a source of ignition on a standard sofa. This is a home stroke office environment. Not too much to burn in here, but we've got the time elapse at the bottom and the temperature, the ambient temperature in the room. Oops, move something so it stops. There we go. So the ambient temperature at the moment is 18 degrees and we're 15 seconds in. And it will steady, steadily increase and time elapse. So we've got a bit of a scorch pattern going on the sofa. So that's a much bigger one. As you can see, the smoke's already starting to, to rise. It's starting to be there a lot more than it was previously. We're starting to develop a smoke curtain that's steadily fixing itself to the ceiling. And the camera's pulling back. The temperature's already gone up three degrees, four. And we're two minutes in. Again, start looking at the amount of smoke that's coming out of that room. Just turning four minutes. The temperature's just going to jump to 300 degrees. And you'll see now the temperature starts really ramping up. So 10 seconds in, it's already ramped up another 100 degrees. And another one. So again, keep an eye on the amount of smoke that's coming out of that room. Okay, so we've hit 600 degrees, uh, which is at that, this point here, we're talking about flashover. 
where anything that's combustible in that room is automatically on fire because of the radiant heat in there. And again, the amount of smoke that's coming out there is ridiculous. The edge of the door's now caught fire. And now escaping into the next compartment. Okay, so following on from that video, some of the common materials that we're using in construction, um, things like PVC plastic, that has a melting point of around 200 degrees. So again, that's gone in the first five minutes of a fire, as is things like fiberglass insulation, uh, the windows that's in, the, in, your, in your home. Uh, and again, aluminium has a melting point of 660 degrees. Again, aluminium oxide, thankfully, not quite as high, uh, as low as that. Um, but again, it's still starting to be seriously affected by the heat. OK, moving on to testing criteria. OK, so we're not too bothered at this point about the load bearing capability. But we are interested in the integrity of the seal that we'll need to re reinstate. So the integrity is the ability to prevent the gas and the flame passing through it. So it's a physical, um, physical barrier. Let's put it that way. But that physical barrier still doesn't stop the heat transferring through that penetration. So we need to add in the insulation aspect of things to stop the element um, from burning away and passing the heat from one side of the penetration through to the next one. And how we test things is to see how long it takes from the non-fire side of the element to reach 180 degrees in Celsius above the ambient temperature of the room. Hopefully that makes sense to people. So when we're looking at the any sort of passive fire protection seal, we always look at the integrity of the seal. Is that going to be able, able to withstand the, the pressures and the environment in which it's going to be installed, and then also the in insulation aspect of things. So two typical examples tested to British standards, but very different scopes of application. On the left hand side, it's a very busy um, system. It's typically what we find above, above doorways, uh, in loft spaces, etc. We don't normally find a much easier system to test as in the, on the right hand side. That's not true to what we typically find. How things are set up with the European testing system is it's, it's very defined. Um, and it, again, it allows for the interaction to, to play out between penetrations. What's the edge gap? What's the distance gap between actual different types of penetration. So you can have um, a combination of cables, metal pipes, plastic pipes, etc. But it's how it's laid out, how they all interact with each other, um, what distances they have to be apart from each other, etc. that all makes up a full fire test. I'll come on to a little bit more about that in the next slide, I believe. OK, so the differences between those is that under the European regulations, everything about how to run the furnace, how to lay out the penetration seals, um, how the linear joint seals are done, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, are all very much prescribed and laid down as to how that test must be performed. When it comes to the British standard, unfortunately, we just have the how to run a furnace. Uh, everything else is place it where you want do what you want with it and that we'll test it that way. And whatever you can get out of that is what you're going to achieve. So in that scope of things, things can get manipulated at times. Whereas if you look at the European side of things, everything is very much scripted. And there's a few little other, other differences. On the national route side, so the British standard, um, only, we're only looking at the resistance to fire. We don't look at any of the other product properties, such as the acoustic um, capabilities. 
of the products. Uh, and again, there's no third party control. Um, you can do your own test by yourselves in your own laboratory, as long as you follow the directions that's be being laid out of how to run a furnace. And that's how you can market that particular item, that particular product. Whereas down the European route, we have everything heavily regulated um, and it must be passed on to a third party test laboratory such as Warrington Fire. Um, again, everything that way, we give them the, the products, they set it out, they lay it all out and then they subject it to the test and whatever results they find is what we can then market those products um, as. So if we may think it will achieve EI 120 in a test and it actually comes back as only achieving EI 60, we can only market that product as achieving EI 60. So there's a fair few differences between the two different types of testing. Uh, this is an article that turned turned up a few years back now in the Reba Journal uh, from the Royal Institute of uh, British Architects, where they subjected a British standard collar to the European test system. Uh, this is a four hour rated collar, which went into the into the test and it failed after 25 minutes. And again, please don't take my word for it. The details of the um, the article are there at the bottom. It's called Playing with Fire and it appeared in the Reba Journal on the 5th of November 2015. And again, that's just a brief synopsis that I've put together. Um, there's obviously a much wider detailed um, description of what actually occurred, etc. in the actual document. OK, my favourite part, myths and misconceptions. So mineral wool is fire rated. Yes, mineral wool is fire rated, but mineral wool by itself and alone is not a fire stopping solution. Whereas we have stone wool, mineral wool, that melts somewhere between 1000 to 1200 degrees centigrade. Uh, we also have things like glass wool that melts somewhere between five to 650 degrees centigrade. But to give you a bit of an example of what we find on site. Here we have a penetration going through um, a metal substrate. That's a soil vent pipe, 110 soil vent pipe, and it's just been packed out with loose mineral wool. Now, typically, most people on site don't see that that's a problem until you try to explain to them that about 200 degrees, everything in there is friction fit. So about 200 degrees, that plastic pipe is melted. It's disappeared, that's no longer there. So any insulation that you've put in there is also going to just drop out of the hole. And you're going to be left with quite a significant size aperture through which flame and smoke can pass quite easily. OK, myth number two. Fire foam, expanding foams from a can. Again, are not approved fire stopping solutions. Uh, they are designed for something completely different. They are designed for linear joint seals and they do a fantastic job of that. Not so much around services, plastic pipes, etc. going through a wall. What we see there is a whole host of bubbles. Now imagine those as balloons. You've hundreds of thousands of balloons all tied together, all pinned together, all enjoying life as, as they are. What happens is as it's as the uh, foam comes out of the can, it's pushed out of the can by the accelerant in the can, which is typically butane. As it comes out and hits the air, it starts to cure and starts to cause bubbles. Now each of those bubbles contain oxygen and also butane, which is a fuel. So add heat to that and you have your fire triangle. As I said before, correctly installed PU foam, and it should tell you on the can, or it should tell you on the actual um, manufacturer's website of how that 
um, product has been manufactured, what it's designed for, and the sizings that it can be used in. So typically we find a 15 mil pen wide penetration, fully filled with foam in a 150 mil concrete wall. And it will achieve the fire rating that it says on the can in that application. What it's not designed for is as shown on the other side, around services, around cables, around pipes, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no test evidence for that. And number three goes back to the old days of the uh, building regulations. If it's less than two inch, it doesn't need fire stopping. And slight problem with that, because as, as you can see, on the bottom scenario, a 40 mil plastic pipe that's not fire stopped will allow 202 litres of noxious gas through it per minute. So again, all fire stopping should be done. Any size penetration should be sealed correctly using the right materials in the right manner. Okay, so I've talked about how not to fire stop, what products you shouldn't be using, what products should be, should you be using. Um, okay, so typically within the industry, everybody likes to revert to the use of fire mortar, fire compounds, um, and also bat, fireboard, and mastic. That will only get you so far. And there's a whole host of other things that's out there on the market that will allow you to fire stop correctly. Um, there's pros and cons for using the mortar and there's pros and cons for using the bat. Um, but first of all, you've got to understand the application. So again, this is just a typical, typical example of what you can find above a suspended ceiling. There's multiple penetrations in a small area and each of those require individual solutions. It's not one size fits all, unfortunately. But what we've got to um, start looking at is what is the base material? Is it a solid wall? Is it a um, plasterboard? What is the required fire rating of that wall? What are the size of the penetrations going through? What are the services? What material are the services made from? And what is the size of the service? All depends. If you've got a small cable, it's a lot easier to seal up correctly than a great big cable. So again, when we look at the next slide, it highlights that in there, there's actually four different things that we need to consider. So in the gold circle, we've got metal pipes and metal conduits running through. In the blue, we've got a plastic pipe and a purple cable that's hitching and arrived through there as well. In the green, we've got a damper that shouldn't be sat quite like that. And in the red circle, we've got a small bundle of cables. Okay, so we have a nice nifty little web page that helps us assess exactly what we should be doing and how we should be doing things. Um, this tool will help us generate suitable products for the application. So there's a web, little web page down there, the fsselector.hilty.com, which will take you to the that particular page. And as you can see, there's six little drop down boxes and all you have to do is pre-populate those with the right with the scenario that you find yourself in, and it will spit out the other end some uh, appropriate solutions. Oops, Andrew, I think it'll stop sharing here. Don't know what's going on. I'll try again. There we go. Oops, we've done it again. <laughs> Bear with me one second and put this back on. Coming sound, windows, there we go. Okay. Hey, there we go. So we've got some great little problem solvers that's out there. So for small penetrations and um, such as small cable bundles um, or small conduits, they can be plastic or metal. As long as the penetration size is less than 25 mil in diameter, 
uh, as, less, as long as we've got um, conduits that are less than 16 mil in diameter, we can use these cable discs, which are effectively um, putted, little putted pads you, that come with a sticky back plastic on the back of them. You take off the wrap at the back, you wrap it around the cables, push it against the wall, and that's your fire stopping done on that side of the wall. Whiz round to the other side, do the same again, and your fire stopped in less than 30 seconds. No mastic, no mess, no cutting anything. Just a nice straightforward. Remove the plastic, push it to the wall, and on we go. For larger penetrations, we have the cable collar. Again, this fits on the face of the wall. This is screwed to the face of the wall or the floor. Uh, and again, we'll allow a much larger volume of cables to go through, up to 108 mils in diameter. Typically, though, we have these awkward corner penetrations where we have um, several cables going through actually at the linear joint, which is an absolute nightmare to, to fire stop use in mastics, using batter mastic. Here, it's a nice, simple, straightforward, cut the um, cable. Great labor saving, time saving um, alternative. So again, that can be installed very, very quickly in less than five minutes. Whereas a typical example of a, a bat patris to do that correctly would take you over 40 minutes. So again, you're looking at labor saving. And these can also be repenetrated. So it's not just that that's your final um, solution. And next time you need to put cable through, you've got to put one up through either side of the uh, cable collar, you can actually take the cable collar off, open it up, cut a little bit further out, close it back up again, fix it back to the wall and seal up again. So these are repenetrable. Oops. I need to click, there we go. And again, for much larger, we now have this rectangular cable collar, which is our first sectional um, system. It comes, as you can see, as a square. So we can have one square, two squares, or three, squ three squares together, all bond, bolted up together. And again, that's a great, easy installation. Again, can also get into those nasty, awkward, tight areas uh, such as in the right top corner of a, a room or against right hard up against the the sofa if you're not deal, dealing with retrofitting this is a great solution for working out the cable runs in a new build or way you, if you've got an extension um, these are called speed sleeves so you've got a hollow metal tube that goes through the wall Clamp to the wall, both ends with the oversized uh, screw heads. And in there, as you can see, you've got a smoke curtain that tightens up around the cables and lets very little smoke or airflow from one side of the room to the other. Got four independent wraps. So as the, um, as the fire starts, about 150 degrees or so, those, um, those wraps start to expand and they will actually fill the void. Okay, I've been banging the drum about expanding foam, saying how bad it is. Okay, this is a little bit different. This stuff doesn't come out of a cam. This is our flexible intumescent foam, and it does exactly what it should do. Um, it's a flexible foam, so once installed, it doesn't harden, it doesn't go off as such. It does cure, but it doesn't go off. Uh, as you can see, the picture on the left-hand side is a gentleman pushing a, a new cable through the penetration. All he's done is rattled a hole using a screwdriver or something and pushing the cable through the penetration, through to the other side. 
so it's repenetrable. Again, this comes in, in a pouch that's dispensed through a manual uh, dispensing gun. So there's no solvent, there's no air that's driving it out of the can. And this is a lot heavier, a lot more, um, a lot denser uh, matrix than the, the stuff that you get out, out of an aerosol can. That's a great get you, get you out of trouble uh, product. Pipe bandage. A lot of people don't quite get this one when they first look at it. It's just a bandage that wraps around um, combustible insulation. So as it shows on the right hand side, you've got a metal pipe. In the event of a fire, that metal pipe's not going to burn away. But the Armaflex insulation that's around it will. So we wrap the bandage around it so that in the event of fire, as that Armaflex uh, insulation is burning away, that bandage is just going to swell out and take the fill the void that's left in its wake and hold and grip onto that, um, that metal pipe very firmly and ensure that nothing transfers through. One of my favourites, the endless collar gets you out of so many problems. We often find things like pipes on an angle. As you can see by the picture there, that is a knuckle joint that's coming through the wall. And typically people try to put a standard pipe collar on and find that it doesn't quite fit. You can't quite get the ends to meet, go for a bigger size, and that doesn't quite manage it also. You can't get the the ends of the pipe collar around the the knuckle joint itself. It just won't fit. It's too close to the wall. So again, we have a system that's a flexible system. And following the guidelines, it will teach you exactly how to get around that system. It's also good for pipes that are uh, in the corners, too close to the back wall or too close to one edge or the other. Um, you can do two pipes together three pipes together, depending on the size, etc. We've also got a shaft wall detail where it's a single sided application. So you can work in the riser and push the collar through to the other side. It's quite a lot of talk about CPVC pipes at the moment. Um, we're finding hell of a lot of these everywhere. Blazemaster being one of the manufacturers, um, products and also flame guard with two two ways of sealing these uh, within a, our product range uh, that are very simple and easy to use we can use the red fil mastic as you can see being applied to the blocks at the bottom there or alternatively we can use one of our um, insulated sleeves now the insulated sleeves you don't need any mastic or anything for so therefore it's a much easier solution um, there's no, nothing in there that's going to um, um, mess up the materials that the Blaze Master's made out of. Okay, and that is pretty much the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? All right, well, thank you, Martin, for that. Um, we have okay. got some questions, yeah. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a couple. If anyone's got any other questions, uh, please submit them. Uh, Martin, if you'd be kind enough to stop sharing your screen, yep, sure. that would be great. Thank you. There we go. Fabulous. Okay. So, um, James Paddock, did you have a question? You had your hand up. No, okay. Well, if you do, perhaps put it in the chat for me. Um, let's go to. Um, I mean, you, you did cover it, but I'll I'll raise in Sanderson's comment um, about the forty mil um, diameter pipes. Yep. Um, only requiring an annular annular seal. Um, you know, any views on that? Um, if it's a 40 mil pipe, um, it does require a seal. Um, but if it's a plastic pipe, 
it will require uh, an intumescent seal so that that's going to close up around the pipe as the pipe melts. Um, but again, it's, we're just trying to make sure that everything's done in the right way. If it's a metal pipe, it will need an annular seal. Um, and again, it's got to, but that by providing that annular seal, you will only be giving, if that is a naked metal pipe and there's no insulation around it, then you'll only be able to provide a, uh, an integrity seal to stop the, the smoke and the flame going through from one side of the wall or floor to the other. There's been no insulation rating in there whatsoever. Yeah, I think I think Ian's point is about the interpretation of ADB and yep. that a lot of people would interpret that you just don't need to um, do anything other than an annular seal on a 40 mil pipe or smaller. Um, and yep. some people feel quite strongly that that's um, that's not quite right and others will interpret it quite strictly. Um, I suppose I, I suppose what I'm asking is, you know, what's what's your view? My view is to, is to is to go belt and braces if at all possible, wherever possible, to make sure that if you've done the work, you're not going to be stood in the dock when something goes wrong. <laughs> OK. Um, so we've got a question from Ian, have you got something you want to say? Because you put your hand up, actually. Uh, yes, it's actually just to sort of more or less emphasise what I'm saying. Um, I'm not perhaps absolutely up to speed in ADB, uh, given the recent changes. Uh, but certainly as far as I understood, and if, under ADB and certainly in the technical handbooks in Scotland, you don't require to fire stop 40 millimetre pipe. I've had this conversation on many occasions with uh, a colleague of yours, uh, Martin, uh, with Alistair Brockett, <laughs> uh, who's also one of my former students as well, by the way. Um, and it's actually one of, one of my former PhD students, uh, he carried out research and he got some tests carried out at Trada, which basically, it, you know, at best indicated it was questionable to have a 40 millimetre penetration without it being appropriately fire stopped. Uh, we can't say definitively it's a case that it wouldn't work uh, because we're only able to finance one test and obviously needs more than one test to actually prove things definitively. But the UK and Ireland are the only places in the world that actually accept this. In fact, um, as a researcher appointed me the director of Vita Babrowskis to actually get some data from him, uh, who's somebody that a lot of people on here will know, and he was absolutely appalled that this was acceptable. So I can't see why it is continuing to be within, uh, seen as being acceptable under building regulations. And I'm certainly totally for uh, ensuring that all penetrations are properly fire stopped. Yeah, I take your point, Ian. Um, let's ask Mark a question that's been um, that's been asked by Brett Gilbert and it says what if there's no access to the other side of the wall so I guess this was when you were showing some of the products yeah. and um, yeah does that make sense to you? It does yeah it's a common common issue that we come up against um, we do have some products that we can use in single-sided applications um, such as the FX foam that I showed. Uh, we also have the um, the intumescent blocks that I didn't in the presentation. Uh, they can be installed from one side of the penetration only, only and that is compliant to do so. Um, whereas most most of the time, a lot of the tests are done um, so that you have to go to both sides of the penetration and put a closing device there. No, that so makes again, sense. there's a yeah, there's there's a lot of times where people are using things like bat and mastic, where you have to get to both sides of the penetration, or to put a collar on, you have to go to both sides of the penetration. It's it can be very difficult. No, that makes sense to me. So the the blocks you're talking about are, are literally um, they're sort of brick it's a so shape. Yeah, it's a solid version of the foam in brick shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty, um, 
A question from Stephen Elgar. He says, sure. um, can these only be used for particular fire resistance of walls, e.g. 30 or 60 minutes? And I'm sorry, but I don't know whereabouts in your presentation that was. Um, I think I saw that one come through at the cable collars. I okay. believe it was. Um, they can provide uh, up to two hours of fire rating uh, if installed correctly on both sides of the penetration. Yeah, hi Martin, it's Steve here. Hi, Steve. Um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I was just kind of making a point that, that, that obviously the fire stopping material has got to be compatible with the fire resistance of the wall it's going through. It's a bit of an obvious yep. thing, I suppose. Um, do you actually make a practice of, uh, of labelling as well um, uh, from, a, from the fire stopping material point of view so that it's um, identifies the fact that it meets a particular fire resistance. Yeah, um, again, that's that's part of a, a software that we have uh, available, um, which can uh, contractors can use to identify and show before and after the actual installation, yeah. and then document precisely what products they've used against what type of rating of wall or floor. And, and again, it just makes sure that everybody's keeping themselves compliant with everything that's going on. Yeah, from, from my part, I'm a risk engineer, so um, when we're on site, it's it's difficult to, to obviously some kind of see the compatibility between the, um, the, 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 the product being used and and the, uh, uh, the fire resistance of the particular aperture it's going through. Quite get that. So that helps that. <laughs> okay. Um, question from Stuart, who says, "How long does the application last in years, please?" And I'm guessing that's in relation to the um, silica silicon um, product. Um, it <sighs> We have some test data that indicates that our products could last up to 30 years if left alone. So it's been installed and left alone um, and then put into a into a fire situation and it will work as though it's a brand new brand new seal that's just been made. Okay. So we're looking about the lifetime of a building being effectively about 30 years as in the working life of between actually having to have one penetration seal completed and then reinstated many years later. Okay, I suppose my question in that regard then is, is kind of linked to the um, labelling. Does it actually say on the label in terms of kind of, you know, end date of? No, no. Uh, we. Most of our products, if they do have a use before date, it's to do with the mastics or the wet or the foam or the wet products that um, do have a shelf life and they typically have about a 12 month shelf life that they must be installed from manufacture um, before they're actually installed. So you've got that shelf life after that, that's as long as the seal lasts. Um, again, with building movement, further penetrations, etc. So in terms of visually then, would you see the degradation that would allow you to have some concerns or would it would it look acceptable but not not provide its fire resistance? Does that make yeah. sense? You, usually you'd see the degradation in the actual product itself. You'd see that things don't look as um, airtight or etc uh, as it should do as it when it as it should do when it's first installed um, there might be pieces missing off it there might it might start to um it might, might be areas of concern that you think to yourself that doesn't look quite right that needs to be either be repaired or reinstated yeah that makes sense okay so question from matt murphy how long will BS476 remain a credible standard for testing? Um, it's currently being reviewed at the moment um, to become BS EN 1366. Um, so it's it's becoming, uh, it's already under review. Uh, and obviously a lot of people are now testing um, to make sure that their products meet that standard. Thanks. 
sense to me. Um, but again, we come across this type of thing uh, very very often, where um, such things as high expansion mastic wasn't available a few years back, but say 10 years ago, it was never even thought of. Um, so everything was installed using different types of mastics and different scenarios. At that time, that was installed correctly. And the test evidence was to show that that, that was installed correctly. But moving fast forward, we wouldn't use that system anymore with far more robust systems available. And that's how we try to use those. That makes sense. Um, question from Ekpanudim Friday. How can electrical cable bars linking several floors be fireproof between each floor? Uh, buzz bars. Right. Um, normally what happens with those is we um, use intumescent cushions or we use the intumescent blocks um, as a fire break as it passes through each individual floor. OK. And presumably you have some information on that on your website. Yeah. So if you look at the um, CFS hyphen CU, uh, those are the cushions. There's some information there in the actual um, product details itself about how they can be installed. Thank you, Dokey. A uh, question from Mark O. Should floors be fire stopped from both sides? A client has fire bat. A client has fire bat the floor, yep. not on the ceiling below. The room below is a fire risk. Okay. Um, Depends on the fire rating that you are wanting to achieve within the actual um, floor penetration itself. If the fire bat is just sat on top of the floor, then that really shouldn't be happening. Um, it should be sat in actually with it set within the floor itself. It shouldn't just be sat loose on top of the floor. We see that quite often, and that effectively is going to provide very little prote um, protection. So it's literally just balanced on top of the floor, is it? Yeah. Oh, OK. We see that one very often. But again, um, most of the details that we have are through solid floors. Uh, if you need to start looking at plasterboard ceilings, we've uh, some test data for things like that. We've ways around the, um, fireproofing those. OK, so I think maybe Mark's question is about does the fire stopping need to be the full thickness of the floor? Does that make not, sense? Yes, it does. Not potentially. If you've got a 200 metre, uh, sorry, 200 millimetre thick concrete slab, um, your bar, your fireboard is only going to be um, 50 mil. But again, that may be, may be able to provide you with 60 minutes of fire protection. But it depends on the rate of the floor. You need to reinstate to the value of the floor. So in that rate ratio, you're probably looking at a two hour rated floor that's only been um, reinstated to 60 minutes. So something needs to be done in that area. OK, and presumably if the thickness of the, the fire resistance solution is less than the thickness of the floor, then you would yep. want to make a flush floor rather than a flush ceiling so that you have something to fall into. Yeah, that exactly. Yeah. OK. Um, question from Brett Hibbert. Do you have an approved contractor list? And if so, how do you ensure competency of contractors? Oh, um, yes, we do have an approved contractor list. It is very, sh very short, uh, which might give you a bit of an uh, idea of um, how things how bad things can get out there. Um, we approve um, contractors only after looking at the business itself. Um, so do they have a robust management system? How are they regulated? Are they third party accredited? Maybe one, not even maybe once or twice or even three times, depending on the type of penetration seals that they're looking at or the type of applications that they deal with. Um, we also look at all sorts of things. Um, are the lads fully trained to NVQ level two? Um, when did they last have any product training from ourselves? 
etc. We do all kinds of trainings with them to ensure that any new starter goes through an induction period. Those types of things just to make sure ensure that we always have a good uh, quality of of finish at the end of it. And then to, on top of that, if they are an approved contractor, generally we're involved uh, from the team that I'm part of. We will go actually go to site and again double check with them how they're approaching certain things, how they're installing things and making sure that everything's done as per the standard details that was being provided. Yeah, I suppose that's the question I've got then is um, I see a lot of product being delivered to site and then it's a bit disappointing when you see how it's been installed. Um, you know, is there is there a method that you use to um, help contractors or installers to understand how to do it properly? Yeah, um, we run through um, a lot of the, the standard scenarios. Uh, we look at various different types of products and why certain ones should be used in in certain cases, but don't work in others. Um, it is a bit of a minefield. Um, I mean, slight changes can mean it's, it's more favorable to use product X rather than product Y. Uh, but again, it's trying to in, ensure that, that those types of learnings are drummed in into them. So the customer, the end customer gets the best result and the contractor does the best job they can. Um, and again, time wise, so they're not spending uh, going over the top on labor charges and again with the right materials. Does, does the products, do each of the products come with instructions? I mean, is there any excuse for someone who, yeah, do, do, do they, I suppose my question was, is there any excuse for someone who doesn't know how to fit the product in terms of having that information within, you know, the packaging? Um, most of the time, uh, the instructions actually come with the, the product itself, uh, with details of how to install it, how to how to install it correctly um, but again if you're dealing with a contractor or um, a subby that doesn't normally do that type of work um, and has just been told put a collar on that well yeah they'll put a collar on it they won't know that they've got to smoke seal around the collar between the collar and the floor or the collar and the wall they won't need to know that you've actually got to put a mechanically fix the collar to the wall or the floor you don't, you know, the, the collar might end up actually on the floor as opposed to being on the ceiling and mm -hmm. things like that. So again, there's there's lots of areas for things to go wrong, but we try to make sure that anybody that's using the products are using them right. Because at yeah. the end of the day, you've, you've, paid a, you've paid your money for a product that you think is going to do the job. We'd like that to be done as best as possible. Yeah, I, I suppose you can have a good product, but if you don't install it correctly, then you almost might as well not have bothered really. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so question from uh, Tim Locke. Here's one that could be interesting, okay. <laughs> I recently did a fire risk assessment on a four-story private school. Okay. It has a rope bell pull that penetrates from ground floor to the top floor to ring the school bell. Is there a product that can be fitted in the channel between right. floors, thus keeping the highly valued rope bell pull? Okay, so I'm guessing the, the rope has to move. Yep, it does. Right, so um, any ideas of a solution to that one, Martin? Uh, typically what happens is uh, the actual um, area that the, the bell pull would actually go would be boxed out. Um, it would be kept, but unfortunately, you're going to have to um, create its own penetration, its own um, compartment for it to move within. Now, that can be quite significant or it can be quite small. Um, usually, they're using fire bar or they're using um, plasterboard, etc., to achieve that. So, what you're talking about is creating almost like a riser. Its own riser, its own chimney. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go, Tim. Um, it can be maybe, done, but maybe maybe think about a riser. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Phil Stacy says, "Can you share the web page for your approved contractors list, please?" Is that possible? Um, 
yeah, that's not on the web page. It's under review at the moment. We can share that. Um, if you want to reach out, I can send through the list. That's not okay. a problem. Okay, no worries. I can put Martin's email address in the chat in a moment. You're welcome, Phil. Um, okay, that has finished our questions that have been sent in. Last call for any last questions. No? Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to round off tonight's webinar. So thank you, Martin, for giving us tonight's presentation and sharing sharing all of that with us. Um, I'd also like to thank Techfire for providing the IT for running this webinar and also to my fellow committee members in the Southern, Southern Branch uh, for making this webinar happen. Uh, and I'd particularly like to thank Dean Morris because um, he's our webmaster and he has created our new branch website, which will be um, hosting this recording um, probably in a couple of days, maybe a week's time. So you can you can find it there um, in a little while. Um, our next webinar is planned for the 11th of August. Uh, it's not the first Wednesday because there's an IFSM conference on, so it's on the second Wednesday for a change, uh, the 11th of August. And on that day, we're going to have uh, Steve McGrill give us some insight into external facades and risk assessment. And if I can do it between all the thank yous, which is very generous of you, she says, oh, she's not great at IT. Right, there we go. So that is the link if you want to register for the August webinar. Uh, the details are also on our on our website and also on our website are the September and October webinars, which are now um, registering and booking. Um, but for now, thank you to everyone for attending.